muscles and causing pain over the next 48 hours or so. Once again, fewer injuries occur if one is very flexible. And I mean, that makes perfect sense. You know, if you're rigid and you step off a stoop, you're less likely to fall like a tiger and more likely to fall like a brick. So uh, it's very important to be flexible. Here's a little Snoopy thing. No membership dues, no special equipment, no funny clothes, just start walking. That's a great way to start exercise, right? It's aerobic, it's not, uh, it's flexibility training, it's not resistance training, it's aerobic, but it is very, very effective. And in fact, there was just a study released showing that people who park far away from stores, people who take the stairs on a daily basis instead of the elevators, live longer and have fewer heart attacks than those people who don't do that. So just walking is good. It's a good start. Okay. Next is diet. Now, I don't know about everybody in this room, but when I watch television, watch shows on nutrition, I get totally confused. All right? I know a fair amount about nutrition, and yet, you can turn on the television. There was a, a Today Show series which showed one day was the Atkins getting up, the next day uh, somebody representing an Ornish type diet, um, Sugar Buster's diet, you know, cabbage soup diet, there are all these different diets and each one gets up and says my diet's the best because such and such and you know and it is totally confusing. So I, want, I hope to clarify some of these issues for you. And I think the basic problem in all of these diets is people try to look for absolutes. They, they, they lump all carbohydrates in one category, all proteins, all fats, they're all the same. So eat uh, this amount of carbohydrates or this amount of protein or this amount of fat on a daily basis. And in fact, that's just not the way God made it. Carbohydrates are not all created equal. There's something called the glycemic index. Does anybody know what a glycemic index is? Who knows? Glycemic index. Okay. Um, that's because he's premenopausal. No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the glycemic index is a measure of the speed or the rapidity with which a sugar molecule is absorbed or sugar entity is absorbed through the intestinal lining. All right? So how rapidly sugar is absorbed through our intestines is represented in the glycemic index. The higher the number, the faster the sugar gets absorbed. The lower the number, the slower. And the reason this is important is if a sugar is absorbed very, very rapidly, then the, it goes into the bloodstream and insulin surges. Now you get a sudden peak in sugar, insulin surges to deal with the glucose, with the sugar. And what does it do with it? It converts it to fat. Right? It locks it up and stores it as fat. Our body has a very poor capacity to store sugar but it has a great capacity to store fat. Right? So this sugar is then converted to fat. That's high glycemic sugar, or high glycemic carbohydrate. To, excuse me. So what are some examples of high glycemic carbohydrates? Well, what's that? Pasta. Well, you know, it's interesting. Pasta is a little higher than, uh, than others, but it's, it's also it is a complex carbohydrate. It's, it's an interesting substance, pasta. We, pastas and some breads, we think of as simple carbohydrates. In fact, they're actually complex, but they tend to have a higher glycemic index. So yes, pasta is a good example, but it's a, a little bit more confusing than another example, which would have been like table sugar, a candy, a cookie, you know, the, the really, really simple sugars. A banana has a higher glycemic index than a grapefruit, all right? So, you know, I see a lot of patients, they say, well, I'm eating everything right. Uh, you know, for breakfast, I have a couple of bananas and, uh, you know, Rice Krispies. And I say, well, so uh, bananas tend to be high glycemic. In fact, the more ripe they are, the higher glycemic index they are, right? So a less ripe banana is less fattening than a very ripe banana. Right? So you're, you're starting to get the sense that you can't lump these things together. What about fats? Well, people try to do the same thing with fats. They try to say they're all created equal, and they are certainly not all created equal. There are saturated fats, there are monounsaturated fats, there are polyunsaturated fats. Saturated fats, which come from meats and cheeses, saturated fats raise cholesterol. Monounsaturated fats do not raise cholesterol. In fact, monounsaturated fats, like in olive oil, 
or oleic, which is oleic acid, um, tend to lower the bad cholesterol. Right? Canola oil also has oleic acid in it. So the monounsaturated fats are good. The polyunsaturated fats have some very good fats as well. You've all heard about fish. We should be eating fish. Well, that's because of the polyunsaturated fats, the omega-3s. And the polyunsaturated fats tend to, to turn our body's formation of prostaglandins in a good direction. Basically, prostaglandins are these little uh, substances floating around our bodies, and they're good and bad prostaglandins. The omega-3s tend to steer our prostaglandin formation to the good ones, to the anti-inflammatory ones. So that's why those fats are, are good. So if, you're, if, you, if you say to somebody like Ornish does, stay on a very low-fat diet,